something sur la réalité, something above it is a hovering. It's like a dream where you kind of know where you are. You have seen everything, but it's different and it feels uh, foreign, it feels uh, um, 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 alien, and it is almost like we are in a science fiction movie where um, actually now the reality is uh, stronger than, than that uh, fiction. Um, we have talked for over four months uh, with theater artists, and, uh, and now uh, we have started to enlarge our scope, our focus, and we have thinkers, curators, producers um, with us, and Hamburger will be with us tomorrow. Um, actually students uh, from New York City on Friday. And today we have with us a great uh, worker um, in the field of theater in New York City, someone who is truly admired, beloved, I even would say, um, and respected in the New York City performing arts world um, in our um, field and part of the landscape of that big, big uh, field of theater, it's Jay, uh, Jay Wegman, who is the director of the NYU Skirball Center for the Performing Arts. And he's uh, the artistic uh, leader since 2016, before he did fantastic and great work at the Abrams Art Center and at Henry Street Settlement. He got an Obie Award, a Bessie Award, uh, many, many others. Um, he was a fellow of John F. Kennedy Center uh, Foundation for the Performing Arts and um, and of course, as influential in what he presents, I think his uh, presentations of work um, at a university in the United States, I think is leading on the scale of the productions when it comes to, to presenting. And um, of course, it's also a different mission than at Bard, you know, which is part of a theater program where there's also teaching workshops and creating work. But when it really comes uh, to presenting, you know, there are the three great uh, places, CalArts, I think Montclair University, but at the moment, uh, the Skirball NYU um, um, seems to be um, um, uh, a place that uh, really is openly seeking for, for, for answers and, and help us to ask better um, questions. Um, as we say with artists who are in the moment, anticipate the future. Also, Jay, you know, has to see what is going on there, what is happening, what will happen. And of course, everything also has come um, to a hold. Um, this program is about listening. And as we say here, radical uh, listening. So I apologize always uh, for, for talking so much in the very beginning. Jay, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you. And thank you for that lovely introduction. That was... Uh... <laughs> nice to hear. No, no, it's uh, all true. And you know, um, I mean it. I know I can only imagine on how many Zoom calls you are um, ev on every day. Um, tell us a bit, you know, um, you are the first or one of the first also we have um, a, um, of an artistic director of a presenting space, a strictly presenting space. Um, how are you experiencing this time? Uh... I hate saying it's a new normal because it doesn't feel normal and it's really not new anymore. But uh, what we did was, you know, in March, just like everybody else in New York City, we canceled the remainder of our season and we didn't know what was going to happen uh, for the fall season. So that, of course, was canceled. And then I was just informed because we're not independent, we do uh, function well within New York University that uh, our spring season most likely would be canceled as well. And this was in light of both what the Metropolitan Opera said, it's also what uh, you know Broadway announced. So fingers crossed, uh, we will kind of pick up where we left off uh, in the fall of 2021. It's going to be kind of, as a friend of mine says, a Frankenstein season, which is a little bit of what's left over and what we wanted to do. And of course, with the changing political landscape, we have to be nimble with that, um, with what's going on in the culture. Uh, so it's, even though we're not in the theater working right now, we are certainly all working behind the scenes like we always have. Mm. So when did you uh, hear that you won't have a the spring season next year? Uh, probably two weeks ago. I still have my fingers crossed. Uh, it is an 800 seat house. And we were planning on doing some smaller things with the audience seated on the stage. 
So perhaps we can still do that and maintain some very good social distancing in the house. Uh, but again, it all depends on what the governor, what the mayor says, and of course, what the president of the university says. Um, we won't be doing any of the large things we were anticipating, um, such as a, a loop of production, but uh, there are some smaller things that I think uh, we might be able to pull off. So mm -hmm. wait, wait, wait on that. Um, in Europe, um, often it's 20, 30 percent. In France, they even up to 50 percent. Do you think um, it is a realistic chance? Something well, I, I'm on this informal network of um, downtown presenters in New York City. And so we, we each have our own challenges in terms of the size of our spaces. Skirball is definitely the largest of all these spaces. So we can be the most flexible, perhaps. But uh, we don't have any guidelines yet. The, uh, nothing has been stated about opening up uh, theaters for performance. Uh, I know churches have been able to open up at some level. Um, I have no idea how that's going. Uh, but I know that there aren't any um, theaters in New York City who are actually doing live performance within their venues. Certainly, people have gone outside to do things um, also. Uh, certainly a lot of people have gone to the Zoom platform or to some type of internet platform, but um, we're all still treading water and it, it, it does get a little surreal. I mean, thinking that it's October right now and <laughs> this is, you know, I mean, who, who in their wildest imagination thought a year ago that we would be living like this right now? I mean, it, it just boggles my mind. It's incredible. I mean, we are starting our Prelude Festival today. We've done it for 15 years. It's online only. Um, it's, it would have been unthinkable. It's against everything the festival stands for. If I understand you right, New York City will look at the theater season opening for next year, September, October. So, Yeah, at least the larger venues. So, yeah. I mean, so we need people like like CUNY doing the Prelude Festival to keep us mindful of still what's out there, even though we can't be there in person to see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, it is truly a most, a most serious uh, state um, uh, of the theater at, at the moment. And, uh, and Marvin Carlson always pointed out that in the, even in the history of theater, a complete shutdown, even so now it opened again in, in Europe and many other places, but for a while, the entire theater world shut down. It has never happened in the history of mankind. So um, we are living in times that are unprecedented and changing. Um, Jay, for you as a presenter, these days where you're, I assume, in your apartment and looking at your walls, at your books, in the mornings, you get up and look at your computer and say, what meals do I get today? And, uh, and you're not out in a group, not presenting, not talking. Not, not... Is something changing in the software of your hard drive of your brain? Yes. What you're doing? <laughs> yes. Uh, Skirball uh, kind of has a twofold mission. Certainly the presenting uh, international performing arts is our primary thrust. But we also, since we are well within a university, we focus on discourse as well. So uh, um, early on, we, we decided not really to move the arts presenting part to the web because I, while some people can do it very well, uh, Scribble just wasn't in a place to uh, start doing live work online. However, uh, we have become very, very well versed in doing a lot of public talks that we used to do for the university anyway. So our, I have become very adept at running Zoom webinars. Uh, I've taught myself how to uh, do all kinds of uh, Premiere, Adobe Premiere Pro things on how to put little films together. So for me, I have learned all these skills that I never thought, one, that I would need, and two, never do. So, um, but that's unique to NYU. That's unique to to where we are so and also nyu has been very kind uh in supporting all the staff we have not been subject to furloughs 
Uh, a lot of our staff members have been reassigned within the university to help with PPE distribution or helping with uh, phone lines, things like that. PPE is. Uh... I'm sorry. PPE means uh, the the personal protection equipment, the the mask and the. Um, you know, thermometers, things like that. And also anyone who works at NYU before they can go in a building, they have to take weekly uh, COVID test. And so we are, uh, Skirball is a site at the lobby where these tests are being distributed to, you know, I don't know how many people work at NYU, uh, 30, 40,000 people work there. So, I mean, that includes the hospital and everything. So, um, but uh, yeah, so we are, we are well established in, uh, doing all that. And then the so next week, we are also going to be, I'm very proud to say, uh, an early voting site. So um, we, again, are one of the few places at NYU that is both interior facing, we look in and we support the university, we support the students uh, with our programming, with our um, curricular activities, but we also are very public facing. And here we are doing it um, just like we normally do. But again, without the artistic part. Yeah, it's fantastic to see. Sometimes also our Siegel Theater in Midtown is used for voting. You have machines in there, you see people assembling and uh, being part of a functioning um, system of, of democracy. And uh, of course we encourage everybody to vote, everybody to get out. Anybody who said politics doesn't matter, everything is still the same. You should, who cares who you vote for? It's not true, it became clear. But Jay, my question is, um, you also, let's say, part of the machine, part of the presenting, part of bringing great things over, fighting for the real estate and the New York Times to get a review and uh, and yep. all. Um, is uh, um, is this full break? You know, of a, of a of a big car that's a, maybe even a racing car. What you're driving, you know, um, that's now being blocked. Um, um, is 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 it a moment where you think of what you do or is it a moment to for something you say, we have to do something different or is that a confirmation of how significant it really is because we miss it so much? What is happening? In it's all of that. Uh, on one hand, it feels like a forced sabbatical. I mean, I had no choice but to not do this, but at the same time, um, you know, we need to be relevant. Uh, so that's why we're, we've kind of shifted to the discourse, but also knowing that this isn't going to last forever. So what happens when we can go back into the theaters and will people want to go back into the theaters? And, you know, we do a lot of international programming. Yes. And that was always getting uh, more complicated with the visas. We're getting harder and harder for artists to get them to come into the country. Um, the costs are going up. So, you know, it's, it's going to be much more complicated. So on one hand, um, this enforced sabbatical was kind of nice because a lot of us kind of get on a treadmill and we um, we travel a lot. We're always thinking about what's happening next week in our spaces, but also what's going to happen in two years in our spaces. So it's a lot of um, a dance that goes in on, on people who are fortunate enough to have a job like mine. But at the same time, it can get to be somewhat like a gerbil in the proverbial wheel. So um, this has made a lot of us just stop and think about what we're doing and maybe the way that we've inherited these systems, is this the best way to, to move forward with that? So Skirball on one hand is looking to do more commission work, uh, but knowing that we are not uh, producing theater, we are presenting house. So um, that's, that can be a, a nimble line we cross from time to time but for the most part we we don't have the the capacity to do all this stuff and dealing with the unions and things like that so um but at the same time you know we're conscious about the the world and the climate and people traveling by plane to get here and you know what what ethical responsibility do we as presenters have in uh both honoring the need to make our world smaller, at least artistically, but also to save the world and not to just bring artists over for a weekend and then send them away. So that means that we have to have better networks within both uh, North America, Canada, and the United States uh, on how to uh, bring artists over, not just for one or two gigs, but maybe to 
revamp that touring process that's kind of fallen to the wayside, especially with some of the more avant-garde people that uh, that I like to bring, and certainly Jed over in uh, Montclair likes to bring. Mm -hmm. um, we, there, um, it's often too risky for those type of artists to say go to o Omaha. Uh, so the, I can truly count on one hand really where um, someone like Milo Rao might be invited in the United States. So um, part of that is just educating, you know, our our fellow countrymen about what else is out there. And um, not everything is comfort food in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the performing arts. Mm. So um, I know that the, the, the visa also question is a, is a big thing. Now everybody can, nobody can really travel because of um, the COVID restrictions. But as an international presenter, most as you said in the way, do you feel that this country um, is supportive, is encouraging it, or do you think it's being made uh, uh, intentionally complicated? I can't say that it's intentional because I don't want to be that cynical. However, the reality is that it is getting more difficult. The bureaucracy, uh, the expense, it costs a lot of money to bring someone to this country and forget about the artistic fees or forget about, you know, putting them up in hotels or whatever. It, it's thousands of dollars just to bring in artists. Uh, there, there are people who are trying to fight that, the, the Dance USA folks and some of those other um, professional leagues like that are really trying to uh, talk to government leaders to try to affect that. I don't feel like I have that much, you know, agency in the matter, but I'm glad that other people are. But it's, it's incredibly difficult to bring artist here, even from Canada. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. Well, sure, sure it does. I mean, it's harder to bring someone from the Middle East than it is from Canada. But nevertheless, Canadian artists can't just skip over the border. They have to go through the same amount of paperwork. So uh, it is it's very difficult to bring international artists over, especially the larger companies, because then that cost is just multiplied. So for each visa, often you have to pay a fee, an expedition fee. How much? What, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, it's even more now than it was a year ago. So uh, I'm going to throw out a ballpark figure of around 7000 for a company. But then visas also uh, frequently have to get two visas, one for the artists themselves and then one for the people who come with the company who aren't necessarily practicing artists on the stage but support the team. So um, we're, we're talking seven to $10,000 at a minimum. So it, it's incredibly expensive, as you see. And then um, because we're not commercial, you know, we, we can't pass that. If, if we passed all of our expenses off to our ticket buyers, our tickets would be four or $500 a piece. Um, thank God we are uh, subsidized by, you know, a lot of members and donors and some foundations and things like that. Um, I, I frequently say that NYU doesn't support us. I mean, they give us the space, but they do not give us programming money. So um, we have to be very flexible and creative in how we bring these people over uh, and not um, bankrupt them, us, or the audience members who want to see them. So it's that, and that's just one of the problems facing people in my position. Mm. Oh, yeah, this is, it is quite, uh, quite remarkable um, that festivals all around the world are supported, you know, with, with, with generous uh, amount by, by governments and cities. Um, it is still, um, you know, uh, up to you for fundraising often and the complications to get a visa uh, and you have to prove it. You need letters, you know, from colleagues to say, this is an important company. Um, oh, and there's a scam that you also have to get actors' equity to sign off, and then you have to pay actors. I mean, really, it it does. Uh, scam might be a little too harsh of a word, but uh, it's kind of a pay-to-play type of thing, and it's. Yeah. And so, so we see uh, perhaps less, you know, than our students or theater goes less than even in, in decades before, because it became so expensive, and uh, then tickets became. Um, so expensive and um, we see a backlash with our students sometimes say I cannot afford BAM tickets, I couldn't afford Lincoln Center Theater, 
uh, festival tickets. Um, it's all subsidized Euro stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to even write about it. I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, engage in an artistic or a way or in a way of a uh, research or a critic. Um, so it's a, it is a great contribution that you make, that NYU makes and the Scobo makes, bringing over truly significant artists, things you have shown there would not have gotten here. And they are some of the most exciting, the most remarkable um, 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 work we have seen in New York City, um, I think. Um, Carol Martin, also at NYU, she, she wrote in TDR, she said that um, COVID is creating a new way of producing. Where the, my, one of the most radical differences that will be you know, after TAC, as we say here, the time after Corona will be, there will be a different way of producing because of things like you learn now. Do you feel that's uh, true? Will there be changes in the way you produce, co-produce? Certainly, I'm not aware of her article, but I, I will jump on the internet and find it after we hang up. So I'd like to see what her perspective is, but definitely things are going to change. Oh, things are totally going to change. Anything from, um, you know, the number of audience members who can come in, uh, maybe within five years, we can get back to 100% capacity, but also, you know. You think so, audiences will not come back? I, I'm eager to go sit in an audience again. However, I hear people saying they're scared to go sit in an audience. So uh, I'm hoping that a vaccine is going to be a silver bullet and we can all act like this never happened. But uh, that's just naive. That's never going to happen that way. So Carol is is definitely right. I don't I don't know to what extent, but uh, artists are concerned with their own safety, rightfully so. Coming back in, you know, are the people on the stage or in the venue with you? Are they are they okay? Are you know? So it's a uh, it's a web. It's a network, and it's a matrix. And um, one thread is going to influence another. So definitely. I mean, I've already talked about the international artists, how hard it is to get them here anyway. It will, what will our government say about bringing people in from other countries? Uh, there, there's so many levels to this. It gets to be like a Rubik's cube. And incredible. it's hard to make all the colors the same size. Incredible. Not only you say it will be till next fall, actually around the time now, then till Cedar will we'll pick up. You think it might take up to five years to well, get to I, all these members, people comfortable? Um, yeah. I, not. But you know, Frank, people aren't even going back to movie theaters. So um, I mean, you can't in New York City, but if you read what's happening in the you know in the rest of the country, movie theaters are going to go bankrupt. I read a week or so ago because I can't remember when because time really has no meaning anymore. But AMC, I think, was going to shut down a fair number of their movie theaters. So you know, and that's movie yeah. theaters. The largest British, I think, movie chain uh, declared bankruptcy um, in AMC and lots of them are, of course, close to it. And if this goes on till next summer, definitely it will be a big change that we now finally, we see the industry like with Disney's live streams yeah. that films will go directly to the living rooms and that idea of the assembly of seeing something together in a, in a space also with the movies. Um, might be some a luxury and there will be much many much much fewer possibility we will see it is just incredible uh, the changes that uh, we perhaps are too close with our eyes to really see or understand will be much more uh, clear in the two three ten years from now and but um, i agree with you that it is a time of a radical um, um, change and we have to be uh, part of it to create also something new out of it or something different that perhaps um, uh, uh, takes uh, back or brings us back, you know, to, to the very beginnings of many people, so many artists, we have talked to over a hundred now said, you know, we have to go back to uh, where we started from um, the rituals, the, the small spaces, uh, community oriented work. Well, also I'm, I'm still pondering this article in the back of my head. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of other issues going on. It's just that Corona has forced us to stop and think about them. So there is the climate. There is what's happening uh, to, to, with matters of race, both here in the United States and the world. And, you know, it's sometimes when you don't have this opportunity to pause, this is probably 
one of the silver linings of Corona is it is forcing us to pause and not be knee jerk in our reactions to these things, but to actually take this time and think about, well, what does it mean to um, be a college presenter in New York City? And how do you reflect what's going on politically, socially, economically uh, in the United States? But then also what do you do to help save the climate? Do you just stop bringing artists in? Um, Jerome Bell a while ago said that he was not going to travel anymore by airplane. So um, that, that's admirable, but you know what, what impact is that gonna have on his practice? He, he will only be able to move probably within the European Union. So um, who knows? But so yes, moving forward, things are going to be different. They have to be different. And Corona is giving us a bubble in which to rethink how we might move forward. And I want to say might, because we really won't know how to move forward till we're moving forward again. Hmm. You said we are not engaging in the kind of a Zoom theater performance world at the moment. Why? I think early on, everybody jumped on that bandwagon and the bandwidth was just too wide. And also, um, I will say that I saw some very good things, but also I just saw some things that looked incredibly thrown together. So um, I didn't want, if, if Skirball is going to present something artistically to the world, there has to be a level of production that I'm not embarrassed of. So um, we are talking to an artist who we had commissioned to do something in February. And we, uh, I've given him the, the freedom to move it to the internet if he wants to. My only caveat was I don't want it to look like a Zoom meeting. I, you know, there has to be, and that doesn't mean it has to look like it's on Netflix either. Uh, if he does something that will respond to the medium of the internet in a clever way, uh, um, there's a company named Dead Center based in Ireland and for the Dublin uh, Theater Festival, they actually did uh, an incredibly clever piece that was very well suited to the internet. Um, I think it is online. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but if you go to Dead Center on their website, they'll. Um, I, I would recommend people see this as a as a very interesting, very intelligent way of doing performance for the internet. But um, Skirball isn't there right now. We we present and uh, early on it was great that so Skirball happens to be one of the theaters in. New York City that also presents the National Theater Live broadcast. And so, um, and I don't even know if they're still doing it, but the National Theater Live was doing a lot of streaming. So of course we were advertising that as something we could say we were participating in when we really weren't, we were just passing the news along. Um, so we, we just weren't in a space and there wasn't anything that we were actually going to do that could have been shifted to the internet. But now there are people who are doing it very cleverly. There's New York Theater Workshop, um, some of the things at the public, uh, but um, we're not quite there yet. And because just unlike the New York Theater Workshop or the public theater, we aren't a producing theater. We are presenter. Yeah. So um, it's a little more difficult for us. Yeah, I think I, I never fully thought that through that you are a presenter and actually you're only way would be to present what someone already have it done but they have it on their website they have done it and they don't need you uh, right. and your great beautiful stage and um that is quite um, quite something um do you think that presenters will have in the future um a new um, a new wing like you know lots of europeans either have ballet uh, opera drama uh, the small, you know, whatever, our 99 seat theater. Will there be the digital Zoom theater wing for every theater? Will there be something that people will? I don't know if it'll be Zoom theater, but we certainly can't go back to a Zoom free world. And, you know, again, one of the positive things about the coronavirus was we, um, 
Zoom allows you and I to talk like this. Mm -hmm. And one thing that Scribble did too, again, uh, one of the benefits of being embedded in a university is we uh, started an academic class uh, that the undergraduate students get credit for. Uh, we call it the NYU uh, Scribble Masterclasses. We've invited six uh, artists from around the world to lead six individual masterclasses for NYU students. And uh, that's every other week. And so the intervening weeks are lectures or seminars led by NYU faculty. Now, we couldn't have done this without Zoom. Um, you know, we had uh, Thomas Ostermeyer one week tomorrow, we're having Tim Etchells. Uh, we, there's no way we could have brought them in to do a two hour masterclass. So that that is one of the benefits of Zoom. That is us looking at our constraints and thinking, well, what can we do within these constraints? How can we be creative? So that has been fairly successful. We are making those uh, masterclasses available to the public through our website. Uh, and um, we might continue to do that once we're back in the realm of the normal, whatever that means. Um, but uh, also, we, we do a lot of things that uh, surround our events. And one of our, uh, our staff members, um, Jay DeLeon, started a book club where the books each week were tied into the uh, production at some level. And we've shifted that to the web, uh, well, to the Zoom through our website. And uh, sometimes we get 300 people. We were lucky to get 10 to 15 in the lobby before production. So again, that that's a shocker to us. Uh, it's And it's a huge benefit because it, we're getting our name out there more. People obviously have a need to connect, even though we're all just sitting every day talking only to our computers. Um, but I can't imagine not uh, engaging the internet like like we have been. It's been a very good tool, and I can't imagine that just fading away when we can go back into theaters. Mm -hmm. well, that is interesting about these master artists who you bring in that, in a way, fulfill also the mission of this curve to engage students, to give context, you know, to see this dramaturgical tool to help us think things through and see that theater is an art form and, um, and that there's context and that it actually, you know, provides uh, next to entertainment also a serious, in a way, philosophical uh, yeah. statement but, on, the, on, on us, yeah? Hmm? The dramaturgical part is really, really important to me. And thanks for bringing that up. Um, I, I want to say that uh, I was really, really, really fortunate to grow up where I did. I grew up in Minneapolis back in the 80s when Lee Bu Chule was running the Guthrie. And, you know, I didn't know what a dramaturg was. And their programs were incredible. There were there'd be these essays in them and there'd be these uh, costume design sketches and everything. And, you know, 40 years later, you go to Europe and that's just, everybody does that in their theater, but I had never seen that before. And I haven't seen it in the United States very often. Lincoln Center will put together those magazines. That, and so that that's a good thing. But, um, and that that dramaturgical material that the Guthrie always made available through that their programs was such a part of the production for me. So it's it's been important for me and for Skirball to continue I guess Lee Vujule's legacy in terms of throwing out all these other things that are uh, reflect the production at some level, uh, or or support them perfectly by showing uh, the design process for the for the scenery. So all of that is really really important to me. And but also you don't need that if if you simply want to go watch the production, great. So it, again, it is additional material that could enhance the viewers or the, the audience members uh, experience of what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. So what do you think as a presenter of the idea of the VR world? Um, if some people say um, the VR uh, uh, field missed the Corona time, Zoom took over. Meanwhile, you know, it should have been or could have been. Everybody gets a headset, you know, and they are now down to two or 300 uh, amazing content is out there, but it hasn't taken on. What is, what do you think about the, the VR and presenting and theater artists, performers? I, do you have plans? Do you see things? No, I'm a Luddite. I mean, <laughs> I'm obviously not totally since we're Zooming, but uh, I've only had one experience with VR 
And maybe it's also my age, but um, I went again to see something somewhere in Europe and they, it was a, it was a, um, a workshop, but they were using VR and I found it very clunky and very impressive, but to what end? I mean, I could be sitting here in my living room with VR on, and I guess that's your point, but uh, I, I think I, the part of live performance is that it's live. Um, a hundred years from now, maybe VR or whatever we can't even imagine will be the norm and no one will be talking to anyone in person. But personally, I can't, I can be persuaded otherwise because frequently I do change my mind. But at this point in time, I can't imagine doing, shifting to VR, at least at Skirball, unless it had something, unless it was an integral part of a production that was part of the entire concept. So how's that for an answer? <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's interesting, you know, that it is not, um... I'm not there maybe also it's not working maybe um also it's just also um too new but i feel personally also it's stunning that it doesn't um, that it is not um not um more and present in, in in some way from this thing you say you saw some things that you felt were were good or inspiring you mentioned your feeder workshop or the public uh, the, the the family place but what did what else did you see where you say that's what's interesting if you could share that as a with your curator's eye, where you see that is something perhaps where um, that kind of internet zooms theater or site, you know, um, a pre well, or people could just say, you know, it's site specific. It's just the website at the moment, you know. So, uh, but so what did you see? Where you, that's you clever. Know? Website specific. Yeah. Um, the uh, it was this dead center thing. It was I. I should be googling here, uh, but something called like how to be a machine. And when we went to go buy our tickets, because you they they wouldn't give you a ticket until you had gone through this procedure, uh, you go to the website. Uh, a film kind of comes up and says hello. Uh, please look at the screen, and they're going to take a picture of your face. And then said, "Great, do you like this picture? If so, we'll move forward." So they gave you that choice. And then the next one was they wanted to capture you laughing. And then the next one was they wanted to capture you with your eyes closed or looking like you were asleep or something. And I don't want to give away the whole thing, but all of that was woven into this 40 minute presentation. And it was very cleverly done. Um, it could, they could, uh, I mean, Skirball technically could stream it from Dublin. Um, it was specifically set in Dublin. It'd be, uh, I'd rather do it um, having it, having Skirball be the, the venue in which this happens. But right now that's not a possibility given the restrictions of international travel and whatnot, as I've been talking about. But that piece I thought was great. And it, um, it doesn't surprise me because Dead Center is an incredibly creative theater company. Uh, and this is just another one of their very good productions. Mm. So, um, but I also have to say, I'm not eager to jump on the internet to watch things. <laughs> I guess it's because, you know, I'm working, as I say, just talking to my computer all day. Uh, last thing I want to do is, you know, eight o'clock at night, turn on yet another, you know, performance or something. I'd rather sit on my couch and watch Netflix. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, a true. There's a fatigue uh, and um, and also the duration that we look at is, as you say perhaps it will be 12 months from now you know where we come up so there's a limit to what we can consume and what we uh, can engage with and perhaps it's getting less like an overdoses of uh, of, um, um, of 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 online uh, or live streamed uh, um, um, possibilities and uh, and it makes us long as you say for the life for the real uh, I mean, we mentioned it before now, it was interesting, Heiner Müller said, you know, what uh, people think what makes theater so great is uh, that it's a live audience who share, you know, the, the moment they're all alive. He says, but the thing is, you know, actually the possibility or the potential of the audience member might die is the real importance. You know, that's might be the last thing. Someone, when someone goes to a theater, the last time they see humans on a stage acting out a story, you know, and this is now um, so real. Um, in the moment for, um, for, 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 our, for our things. Jay, 
how did you get into uh, curating that art form? And I see it as an uh, as you as an artist, as uh, someone who collages and that idea of voice of an enlarged, you know, um, definition of art. It's certainly you are. And um, why why do you do that? Why did you decide to uh, present things? Um, twenty twenty vision is great in hindsight. Uh, I have to say I would truly not have seen myself doing what I'm doing now. I'm very grateful for it. And looking back, it makes sense how I got here. But uh, I moved to New York um, in 1990 uh, to actually go to seminary. I was, as I said, I was from Minneapolis. And I had gone through this whole three-year process just to get to seminary, uh, Episcopal, Anglican. Uh, and I want, and there was an Episcopal seminary in New York City. So I thought, well, three years in New York, great. And then I thought I'd probably go back to Minneapolis and be the college chaplain or something. But uh, once I got here, I actually had an internship. Um, St. Anne's Warehouse used to be at a church called St. Anne and the Holy Trinity. So uh, I got an internship there, uh, working with both the church and with the arts program. And then from there, I got another internship at uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, working with the, the arts program there, which at the time was very uh, vivacious. It was, it was something was happening every weekend. Uh, and once I graduated, uh, I was fortunate to get into this great program at Yale. And I was hired at the cathedral. I stayed there for 10 years. And I had some great bosses there who encouraged me to um, think of wild programming. That what did we do for those 10 years? I, I didn't know. Oh, a lot of different things. I was in charge uh, of both the visual arts program. So, um, you know, the Episcopal Church at one time was pretty wild. And um, so we showed, I brought in Andre Serrano, the guy who had done Piss Christ. He was very notorious for that. He also had a series of uh, photographs that had been taken in a morgue. So they, they looked like uh, images out of the Renaissance. So you, there would be a picture of a hand or whatever. So we put those up in, um, during Lent, which is the, the time of um, reflection and denial. And so we, we, and also it's a matter of when you kind of focus on your own death, getting ready for the Easter season. So we brought that in. Um, William Wegman, the guy who dresses up his dogs, um, no relation to me, um, but we did a whole fun series where we dressed the dogs up like, um, not like priest, um, but like they would dress up in choir robes and things like that. And because the cathedral did this huge, um, blessing of the animals every year. So we did that to align that. Um, we did a lot of things around um, every year gay pride, we would do Stonewall celebrations and um, you know, the cathedral's huge. So we would frequently end those celebrations with the big Apple Corps marching band marching from the altar through the cathedral out the front doors. So it was a great playground. Um, and the New York Philharmonic performs there every uh, Memorial Day. So there were these huge events, but there were also small events. So it, it was just fun. Um, and then, you know, I also went to church on Sunday and gave sermons every once in a while, things like that. But the, it wasn't, it's not, not why I was there. I was there to actually weave the arts back into the cathedral. Um, and what's interesting is that my whole artistic career has always been uh, working with the arts, but not in uh, institutions that are primarily art institutions. So uh, I worked in the arts in the cathedral. I worked in the arts in a social service agency. So Abrams Art Center is embedded in Henry Street Settlement. And now I'm working at the arts at a public university. Well, I'm sorry, not public, private, but... Uh, with public programming. Yeah, public programming. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so I kind of fell into this niche of working within larger universities or institutions or social service agencies working in the arts and trying to weave the arts back into a larger mission. So, um, so when I say I would not have seen myself doing that at NYU, because I remember walking by where the, where Skip, uh, Skirball is right now, it's the Kimmel Center. It used to be the Loeb Center. I remember going to punk rock concerts there in the 90s. Uh, and I, who ever sees what they're going to be doing in 30 years? But, you know, so they tore down the Loeb Center, built the Kimmel Center, and now I'm working there uh, 
at Skirball. So um, that that's the through line I see. But I also was always drawn to uh, interesting takes on classics, hence the Guthrie, um, or interesting, um, just interesting ways to do things uh, other than commercial theater. Um, though I have to admit, I did love going to Broadway when I first moved here. Again, at the seminary was literally 15 blocks away from Times Square, so it was very easy to go get cheap tickets at TKTS. Um, and what I liked about Broadway, I guess, was the theatricality of it. So I'm still drawn to very theatrical things. Um, doesn't mean it has to be big and bold and loud, but I do like uh, unique, interesting takes or entrees into artworks. So that's kind of what people see at Skirball. Um, whereas at Abrams, that focus is really more on raising up local artists. Um, when I got to Abrams, that place was very, very quiet during the day. It was basically an after school program and there were three theaters there that were rented out to make some revenue for the settlement and the place was dead. Um, so, you know, knowing that it was a social service agency, uh, which helps people. And I thought, well, the poorest people I know are artists because if they get money, they spend it on rehearsal space rather than, you know, health insurance or anything like that. So we started making the spaces available because they weren't being used anyway. And also eventually getting um, money to commission these artists to do things actually in the theaters and also helping them with some of their basic human needs. If, you know, artists are very, a lot of them are very poor, but are too proud to go on food stamps uh, or, you know, uh, there were, we had clinics and things at, at Henry Street. So um, that was that focus. Just because Skirball's so large, um, we still are commissioning things. We've commissioned, as I said, this artist to do something in February, but um, we've commissioned Rich Maxwell to do a new work. Um, we're, we're, we're commissioning one or two things a year. Um, but uh, I'm rambling, I think. Did I answer your question? <laughs> very, very, very interesting. You know, your journey from kind of a spiritual institution to a so social service neighborhood institution and now to a university. So do you, do you see that uh, in a way um, uh, the, the Skirball is also a cathedral? Is it a, a spiritual side in it? It totally. Side in yeah. I mean, I don't talk this way normally, but um, yeah, I think artists are the priest of the of our contemporary society um, going to the theater or to a dance or to a performance is a very transcendent experience for a lot of people um, or not um, but frequently I used to say that some of my best religious experiences were in theaters that had nothing to do with specifically a, a religious context so um, yeah, I would like to think of it as a cathedral. Uh, also, because cathedrals uh, do much more than just their religious services. So as I said earlier, um, Skirball is going to be an early voting site. Uh, Skirball has book clubs. Skirball uh, invites people in to give, you know, lectures or conversations on difficult subjects. So yeah, um, a, a secular cathedral in the best sense. Hmm. No, and I think it has always been um, a part, you know, of the arts and perhaps, um, in, especially in America, where the, the commercial theater in New York is so dominating in a way, perhaps it's a side that has been forgotten or has not been paid enough attention. And I still wonder all these uh, Broadway theaters that made, I think the industry is billions, four or five, I don't know what the budget is, and are they engaging at the moment, you know, with... Uh, um, artists helping, mask voting, uh, they, are, they are not. And so they are missing one of the pillars, you know, of, of theater that has, and it's neglected. Yeah, I, I, I just feel awful for all those actors or stage crew or all those people who, I mean, I'm sure they're on some type of 
assistants right now. I mean, they spent their whole careers getting to New York to get in on Broadway, and now there's nothing for them to do. I mean, that's true of anybody, but it's specifically no, it's a Broadway. Uh, but that's happening to the downtown scene. As I said, Frank, you know, no one's venue is open. There are places like the Chocolate Factory that are um, cleverly using their facilities to maybe film a dance movie or something, but that's not open to the public. So, you know, people are trying to be creative about how they're responding to one, their continuing need to create and two, the continuing need to receive and trying to dance somewhere between the two. And frequently, as I've said previously, for me, it's Netflix, you know, or Amazon Prime or whatever. But, you know, I, I've watched way more TV the last seven months than I think I ever have in the previous 17 years. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it is it part of, of a reality and, um, and, uh, and for many of the actors, these really, truly great actors on Broadway. The producers, it's more about the producers, I think, the people in charge who run the theaters, which also mirrors the system. You know, the Schubert, it's privately owned, it's designed to make money. The shows that most make most money, run the longest, uh, 1,000, 2,000 shows. In, often in European theaters, after 25 or 50 performances, they get tired of it. They say, we want to do something new, you know? So it's a completely different um, um, idea, but it is, uh, it is, uh, it is hard for, for the artist well, to adjust. Also, you know, England uh, helped, uh, the, the United States would never do this, um, you know, helped uh, subsidize uh, theaters, uh, not so much performances, but at least um, started feeding money into these theaters during the early stages of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts probably threw some money out that they were allowed to within that legislation, but that would never happen in the United States. You know, a billion oh euros, I think they put at museums, theaters, arts institutions, and I think a society has the responsibility to take care of its artists. It never does anyway in the US and it's uh, despicable enough, but at the moment it is devastating. And what will happen if till December or till next June, as you say, predict, and I think you're absolutely right. There's no jobs, no possibilities. Musicians often performed in bars and restaurants, but now you cannot uh, even have a drink if you don't sit down as, an, uh, as a guest in a restaurant and order a meal. You cannot listen to music and uh, so they don't make enough money to hire musicians, you know, because the bars and restaurants make money on drinks. Artists well, cannot work in restaurants. It's disastrous. Yeah, it is. And I do want to give a shout out to some very creative foundations out there who, you know, have let people take their some of the money that have been assigned to specific projects and let the music in general uh, operating or, you know, there's some yeah. really fabulous foundations out there. Um, and I do think, uh, you know, the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, they're hampered because it's public tax money. Uh, uh, but Skirball, actually, uh, no university uh, in the uh, New York City area is eligible for Department of Cultural Affairs. So, um, you know, it doesn't affect us at all. I know, yeah. uh, thank God. But um, it's it, who knows what's going to happen next year with all the tax revenues, you know, being cut, which feeds into what the DCA or NISCA and New York State Arts Council can feed back in. So, you know, going back to, oh, isn't it all better in Europe? Well, yeah, for some things, it definitely is, especially if you want to work in the arts. Mm, and, and we do think uh, access to education, access to healthcare and access to the arts are human rights, basic human rights, you know, and access, you know, to participate in a democratic system. And, um, and all of it, all of it seems to be endangered at the moment. It's shocking. And I think art will have to take a stand, but we don't really know um, how to do it and um, how to react also to a, a figure like Trump that is unprecedented. And perhaps America has no memory of such such a tone, such a discourse he brings up. Meanwhile, many countries in the world, so we have heard that before and we knew nowhere that. That's that not Trump. Don't yeah. talk about Trump. So, <laughs> I spent my whole day Trump trying to not talk about um, that, this, uh, that this will change, but I think the arts also now will have to, to stand up and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, do a part and remind us all of that, you know, spiritual side, but also of the democratic process uh, that it's part of, 
um, uh, and Florian Malsacker talked about the idea that the theater uh, has to represent the multiplicity of the agonism. He said, we now have to create arenas, areas where you show competitions of ideas where we say no side really will win, but let's talk about it and, uh, and let's uh, listen to each other and uh, fight things out and see who, how you can look at different things. But the idea that one side will win is antagonistic. It will end in civil war. It will not really work. It has to be a place of a discussion and theater has a central role in it to work through personal problems, family problems of a city, but also of a state questions of, you know, the person and the individual and, and the state of the politics and ethics and morals and moral theater is a great place to do that. And but the question is, how can we uh, uh, find it? How can we use it? And how can we reinvent it if um, the entire foundations of it here in the US are so um, so endangered? What what do you look forward to? What what do you have plans? Do you have a uh, um, you mean me personally or for yeah. Skirpo or? First, both maybe. What is, yeah. Well, <laughs> I have no plans <laughs> personally uh, other than just seeing, um, you know, what happens here. Uh, I, I used to travel so much and it was a it was a great blessing and a curse, but, you know, just the thought that we can't even go to Montreal <laughs> is kind of just mind boggling to me. But, um, the plans that I have that I'm excited for are the plans for Skirball. We we actually had a very thriving season planned. We we didn't announce it um, because we normally announce our season in May, and there was no reason to announce a non-existent season. But um, mm -hmm. we we have some really great things lined up, and I'm still hoping against hope that we can pick up and move some of those things into next year. And that also means the funding. Um, it also means finding new funding because, um, you know, people frequently think NYU Skirball has deep pockets because we're in NYU. And that's, I, as I've said several times, it's not true. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. it's always a matter of doing some creative outreach to see if some friends will give us money, but uh, we have, I don't want to curse it and jinx it. So I'm not going to say anything, but you know, look next May <laughs> for, for a maybe really exciting announcement. But I also want to say something else because you were just um, talking about even musicians and in cafes and things like that. Um, I know you have Annie Hamburger on tomorrow. And yeah. Annie, um, even before COVID though, was doing really interesting things. Well, Annie's all about site specific. Well, not totally, but you know, um, and was working with these artists and has been able, I think, somehow to bring them along into this COVID environment. So I'm excited to see what she talks about tomorrow because Annie is somebody who's really thinks on the ground. Yeah, and we look up to her. She created Dancing in the Street. She did the Reza Abdu early work, you know, in the Meatpacking District. And left theater for a while, but now is back. And maybe she has some answers from stuff she already did and to see how, I'm sure she um, does. what we can do. And I think she also wants to create a group of, you know, perhaps young curators or curators who get together and find ways of presenting. Um, yeah, Jay, you really, um, thank you. We are coming closer to, to the end of the talk. What do you look, what Netflix series do you look at? What books do you read? What music do you listen to? Is there, you want to share some of that? <laughs> what, oh, look? I'd be embarrassed to admit it, but um, after she died recently, I went on a whole nostalgic Helen Reddy jag. I was like, <laughs> It was just like, you know, I was a child in the 70s and I was just like, I, I find myself incredibly nostalgic lately. So uh, I don't know. Every day is different from the last. And you used the word collage earlier. It is one of my favorite words, but my days become collages. I just, things overlap. There's the Zoom, there's the NYU stuff. There's dealing with um, the my staff who I haven't seen in person for seven months. And then there's what I do with everything else. So the books I read, but oh, I will say there's a great book called uh, Shuggy Bane. Uh, I want to give a shout out, um, book that I just stumbled on. It's great. I think it's for the Booker and for the National Circus uh, Circle Prize. So um, great fiction set in Scotland. 
So um, I wish I was saying, oh, I'm reading Hegel and I'm reading, you know, <laughs> Wittgenstein. No, I'm not doing any of that. I remember when we talked on the phone once in a while, you say, I don't even know what day it is. You know? <laughs> well, that, I knew what today was because I knew I had to talk to you at, at noon. Yeah. But um, yeah, especially if it's a Saturday or Sunday, it's like, what day is it? So, yeah, I mean, you would feel that way too. Yeah, it is yeah. incredible, you know, how... how time seems to be shifting our spaces get smaller we are inside and the way we the other end we collect we connect globally um and but it doesn't seem to real even to be real even when we end our conversation we will fold down the laptops and yep with ourselves we alone we well actually no i will leave mine open because i have a 115 zoom call <laughs> <laughs> we have to be uh we have to uh we have to um and be, be on time. Yeah, so I hope um, um, the plan we talked about and you're one of the first ones we also called, you know, that idea of a 2022 to create in the summer a New York International Festival of the Arts to call all presenting organizations, you know, to participate in the streets and the parks, but also in the venues, some of it curated, hopefully reserved. And we will see if, if this will work out and maybe some of the things you talked about, our artists talked about, the new ways of producing, new approaches will will be represented in that and that we might be able to to pull that off who knows but i think it's something that you know keeps me alive so really thank you for for um for being part of it and since you uh, are have a little background as a you know as a spiritual leader um and you work in the arts and you said i one of the works at abrams which you did so fantastically the community you created this network of people that energy that came out. What do you say to young artists or to artists at the moment? Do you have something? What do you say? What you can say? I would just and say. Twice, uh, what is of significance? What do we have to focus about? What would they be thinking about? I would just want to say, hang in there. <laughs> um, it's easy for me to say that I'm not going to be kicked out of my apartment or I'm not you know, I don't have to go to the food bank or any of that as of now, thank God. But uh, I just say, hang in there. Um, also, you know, my grandmother told me once, we, we, we were not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but she said, you know, don't worry about where the money is coming from. Money usually shows up somewhere. So I, you know, at this level, most artists, at least the artists that I, I love and, and worked with for 10 years very closely, were always wondering where, where's the money coming from? Not only just to pay their artists or the spaces or anything, but just to live. So um, I guess trust the universe that it might be rocky and bumpy, but usually you come out on the other side better. How's that? It's a little, little Mary Sunshine, but I do believe it. We, we, we uh, trust you, you know, and this is your advice and we take that uh, very serious, you know, um, what you were talking about. And this is a significant um, um, statement and yeah, no, nothing lasts forever, not the good, also not the bad. This will be over one day and we have to hang in there and, and, and use the time. Uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, stretching, you know, and like it, it's warped. Uh, and um, we cannot believe that's already since March and that it might be till next summer or the fall. It's just incredible to even think about, but um, it is a part of reality and we have to, we have to acknowledge it and see what we can change and what we can uh, to have that vision. So we will see, but uh, Jay, really thank you for, for taking the time and give us an insight, you know, how you experience this as a person, but also in your work, you know, as a presenter who cannot present, you know, who has a space, but the space is closed. Well, who might have resources, but you cannot allocate them. So um, it's a just incredible uh, time. So really, thank you. Thanks for the audience uh, for listening. As uh, Jay said, tomorrow we have the great Anne Hamburger, um, who will uh, share with us a bit of her journey, but also what she's thinking is of importance. And I know she's also a bit angry about many things that are happening now. So I look forward to hear what she thinks art should be doing and what actually she is doing. I think she's preparing a festival in 
November or December. Um, then we will have on Saturday and Friday is a discussion with students. I felt we haven't heard from students. You know, we have so many masters and great thinkers and and artists. But you know, now it's also a time to to listen to um, to our to to voices from from people who are the future, who will be changing this world and uh, will be part of a part of it. So I will also look forward to that next week. Um, with uh, David and Miranda, our Prelude curators. We have a selection of artists from the Prelude Festival. Um, also get a little insight. What are New York artists thinking about? The ones who do things, what is on their mind? What are they struggling with? What are they producing or what would they like to produce? So that's why I think it is actually interesting um, what David and Miranda put together, you know, as a little sample of what's on, on artists' mind. Also, we gave, you know, stipends and uh, some honorariums to make something possible. Very little as we as much as we really can do when we stretch. But I think we have to uh, support the arts. We have to support artists. We have to be there. So um, it will be interesting. So I hope everybody might also listen in. And thanks to HowlRound uh, for hosting us and, um, and uh, VJ and Sierra and Andy from the Seagull Center. And again, Jay, thank you. And really all our respect uh, for what you do uh, for the New York Theater, how open you are, the international work you present. And we know how uh, complicated that is. And, and that you really listen to everybody, include ideas, and, and you are creating a community, a center also there. And I think New York needs you, and we, we terribly uh, miss it. So all the best, and um, see Thanks. you soon. Bye-bye. You're the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.